Hello. How's everyone doing? What? Yeah. Look, I'm tired, but you cannot be tired. So let me ask that one more time. How's everyone doing? Okay, that's better. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, we live in Seattle, so flying out here is a, roughly a 10-hour difference or something. And so if I seem a little jet-lagged, uh, it's because I am. But um, I, I, I was really inspired by the last talk, um, you know, about what it takes to be an entrepreneur and, uh, and, and even talking about entrepreneurship. I'll give you a little bit of background about me first. Um, I started my first company in tech when I was in high school. And it, it, was, it was a company that created, our purpose was to create really high-end personal computer systems. Um, we, we created sort of, if you were, think about Ferrari, for example, we created desktop Ferraris. And the purpose of these computers was so that we could play games with them, because gaming was what we were super passionate about. Um, and over the years, we created some of the most amazing computer systems. And, you know, our company was based out of Calgary, Canada. So if you're ever worried about, you know, I'm here in Istanbul, will I ever get discovered? Let me tell you, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're creating something amazing, getting discovered nowadays is easier than it ever was. Um, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But, you know, we were solving a key problem that at the time, there was no kind of uh, lean startup programs or anything. We just kind of built for ourselves. The problem that we were solving was we wanted to build high quality computer systems that were high performance, that were silent. So in order to make them silent, we had to create liquid, cool, you know, liquid cooling. We were fooling around with uh, fanless machines. We were fooling around with all types of technology. And I became an expert in thermal, uh, thermal engineering, uh, design, so hardware design, um, also uh, mechanical engineering, um, all by just doing it. Um, I didn't really have a formal education, which, you know, in, in some ways uh, I look back and I think, was it, you know, is it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? But I, I look now and I think the education system is broken. Um, look, unless you're going to become a radiologist or a, or a lawyer or something where you need a, you know, a serious education to learn a depth of field, I think the, the education system, when students are coming out with massive debt and ending up with, with entry-level jobs, is a, is, is a serious problem. But anyways, we built such a cool brand. And we did this out of a garage in Calgary, Alberta. Um, we, we took components. We actually made liquid cooling systems available in mass to the point where you could install them in thousands of workstations at a time. And this is how we caught the attention of companies like Dell and Hewlett Packard and, and others. And eventually, um, you know, they came along and uh, they bought Voodoo. Um, Hewlett Packard did actually in 2006. Dell actually contacted us in 2005. We didn't see eye to eye on a, on a total strategy. We worked together for a little over a month. Then they bought our next largest competitor, Alienware, for around $400 million. And uh, anyways, so, you know, after selling my first company, you joined the big company. I joined Hewlett Packard. It's my first big company experience. How many of you work in a big company? Oh, boy. Almost everybody. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. It's about a 50-50 split or more. Um, well, look, as an entrepreneur going inside a big company, I think it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I've never met so many lawyers in my life. Oh, my God. Like, you know, I find it hard to hire lawyers just, you know, my own company, but inside a big company, there's lawyers in every hallway. And it was really, really hard to get, um, you know, to get things done when, when, I, when I first joined the company. I was there for three years physically, but my mind was only there for a year. My body was, you know, just there. And I was, I had the entrepreneurial fire that I had to go out and create something again. It was just, it was super frustrating, you know, being inside a big organization. It's a fire that you can't explain. You know, um, we, we just heard that entrepreneurship can be taught, but I really believe it has to be in your blood. And I believe that people in this room have it in their blood to be entrepreneurs, but they're not, you know, the fact is you have to be willing to take the risk of being able to step out of a comfort zone of a job and go out and pay yourself nothing and eat nothing day and night until you build something that matters. You know, when I started Voodoo, 
I, I, I would tell my parents that, you know, I'm going to go out and, and uh, you know, be an entrepreneur and try and build something. And obviously, your parents are super disappointed back then. When I would go, I was, I was trying to, uh, you know, get my wife's um, uh, mother's and father's permission to, you know, to get married at the time. I might as well have told them I was a rodeo clown. I mean, when you're an entrepreneur back then, you're basically unemployed. But now it's a badge of honor. Being an entrepreneur actually means something. Because never in our history has there been a time where entrepreneurship has been so prolific. You know, in, in Turkey alone, there's what, 70 million people, 50% of the people are under the age of 29. Uh, this is a massive market opportunity. And, you know, it's, it's, it would be nice to see more people getting out there and taking risks. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the different ecosystems as well and the difference between why is it that Israel, with only a little over 7 million people, can compete on a global scale. And then I'll talk about China as well as an extreme example of what's crazy that very few people know about. Um, so anyways, I left Voodoo after, you know, HP basically ran it over, which, which, which is what happens when you join a big company and you're not, like, super careful, apparently. And I started another couple of companies. You know, I had a couple of failures. I had a couple of really interesting companies, one in uh, Wall Street Investing, which is still running, and another one in healthcare, which continues to run and continues to lose money, which is always fun. Um, and then I joined Microsoft. And, uh, and this was like the thing that I never thought I would ever do, is join another big company. But, you know, I joined Microsoft and I wanted to see what it would be like to be an entrepreneur inside a big company where everyone is smarter than you. And everyone at Microsoft is smarter than me. It's, 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 it's a really amazing place to work. You know, they're all brilliant people. And, you know, I wanted to create something of value. So we created the first investment fund inside the company that we would invest in startups with very little seed capital, but we would help them grow their business. Because the big thing that we can offer is not access to technology. You know, everybody can get technology and everyone can get money. The biggest thing we can offer is access to customers, right? And that's what we do. We help companies grow their business and then get access to customers. So we operate startup accelerators around the world, and I'll briefly talk about this, and then I'll talk about ecosystems. But we offer, we, we are, we offer startup accelerators in China, India. Uh, we have them in uh, London, Paris, Berlin. We have one in Seattle, and we also have one in Israel. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the different ecosystems, because I only have a few minutes, but just to sort of give you an idea of, you know, what's happening. I just got back from London, actually, and uh, there is, uh, there's a phenomenon happening in London that I'm sort of... Um, a little bit shocked at. I mean, it's sort of turning into a destination. It's becoming a Silicon Valley in Europe. Uh, you know, people would always say, oh, we want to be the next Silicon Valley or we're going to be the next Silicon Valley. But London really has the potential because of all the international uh, presence and the people that are coming there and the investors that are coming there and the government support for um, entrepreneurship. But, you know, in, in London, uh, what's really cool is you're starting to see more and more balanced teams. Diversity. And I'm not talking about just diversity of thought. You know, we have creative people, we have business people, we have technical people, but we also have men and women in the same room, at the same table, building companies together. Israel is, uh, is an area that sort of blows my mind. You know, 4,800 startups, um, they, many of the people come from the defense industry, uh, and, uh, and it's a, it's a, it continues to sort of grow in, in a big way. Um, if you look at uh, the startup ecosystem in Israel, there's 8 million, or se a little over 7 million people, close to 8 million people. But what makes it, what, what's, why they're able to grow or why they're able to be such a big or the second largest startup ecosystem in the world is because they're solving global problems versus trying to solve local problems or trying to replicate what's happening in other areas. They're not solving problems for Israel. Israel has enough problems as it is, but what they're doing is they're, they're, they're really focusing on global issues. And what's amazing is it's actually an issue of mentality. The people there are risk takers. You'll see husband and wife teams quitting their jobs so they can go out and start a company. I mean, you don't see that everywhere. You know, I go to India, right? And in India, there's, uh, there's, there's lots and lots of uh, people that want to be entrepreneurs. But they're not willing to take the risks because governments don't support it. You know, the educators aren't supporting it. It's, it's, it's like the parents aren't supporting it, right? And we're just starting to see it becoming a trend now. There has to be support from these groups, and there's support for it in, in ecosystems like Israel. I do, I'll qu quickly talk about comparing some of these deals. Um, basically, I don't know, did I miss China? What happened to China? There's China. First, let me talk to you quickly about China. I went to China uh, many times this last year. 
There's 1,300 accelerators and incubators in the country. In the country, 1,300 accelerators. It's unbelievable. The valuations in China are absolutely through the roof. I mean, stupid. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. We went to a, 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 a really quick pitch day where we had one minute pitch. We had 14 entrepreneurs come up and pitch five of us, including four VCs, and they pitched their ideas. And the winner was really supposed to get a jacket and a prize and sort of a pat on the back. Well, anyways, this one guy goes up and he pitches his company. And, uh, and I noticed the person next to me writing down feverishly on a piece of paper. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm writing up a term sheet for this guy. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Like, you're joking. He said, no, I'm writing up a term sheet. And he wrote a one-page term sheet, $1 million for 8%, or sorry, um, yeah, 8% of the company. $1 million for 8% of the company in one page. I, 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 was, I was floored. The guy gets off the stage, he comes over, he meets this person, they shake hands, and that's how quickly they wrote a check. The guy started his company 40 days ago, 4-0. I mean, there is definitely a crazy bubble going on, but when you've got companies like Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent buying everything up, there is a drive for entrepreneurship, and people are really starting to step out of their comfort zone to go and create great companies. I did an assessment of six of our companies that have gone through the Microsoft Ventures Accelerator in the last 18 months, just six of them. They started off with a zero valuation. The combined valuation of all six is half a billion dollars. I mean, it's, it's, it is sick what's, what's happening in China. And I think very few people understand it. So when you talk about ecosystems, people always say USA, number one, you know, because of Silicon Valley, and number two, they say Israel. Well, guess what? They forgot about China. Because right now, I would say it's one US, two China, and probably in a couple of years, it's gonna be number one China, and number two, everybody else. So be ready for that, and understand you should probably travel to China to check out what's really going on out there. So, you know, here's just a little slide on comparing deals in the countries. You can sort of take a look at how, how large the, the deals have been. You'll notice that t t uh, Tel Aviv is one of the higher ones. I didn't include China in this, because if I did, the rest of the bars would be this big. Um, so, um, just want to give you some sort of final thoughts on, you know, how I think about the, the, the startup ecosystem. So the first thing, you know, I would say is if you're building a company, you really have to figure out the one thing that you want to nail. So in the case of Voodoo, you know, we built a company that was all about creating the world's best gaming, pers uh, gaming computers. And, you know, around that we built some amazing IP, amazing technology. But the most important thing in that company was that we went into a crowded space, a space where everybody was in it. Every company was building computer systems. How the hell are you going to compete in a market like that? And the way we did it was we built a brand. And we didn't just build a brand with a logo on it. We built a movement. So it starts with a great product, and then it's, it actually starts with your culture, your team. You have to have a team that lives, eats, breathes, sleeps, everything you do, and they love what you do. And then that leads into your product. If your product is amazing, that's a good start. Then you get a community, and you, you, you harness that community. And when you talk about ethics, if you do everything right, that community will love you, and they will stand by you in good times and in bad. Just like when Apple was in trouble, who stood by them? Their community. They were there the whole time. They're rabid fans that love your product. And they become the soul or the foundation of your brand. And so once you do that, you want to get connected to your local startup ecosystem. So again, in Turkey, there is... Uh, you know, we talked about 29 million people under the age of 29, or sorry, 50, um, sorry, 50 percent of the people under the age of 29, which really blew my mind. But when I heard that, you know, there's, uh, there's not as many entrepreneurs, and most of the people work in big companies, I was a little disappointed. You know, I would love to see more and more people coming out to become entrepreneurs. So what I would recommend you do is go spend some time in some of these startup camps, because think about the market potential. Think about the local problems that you could solve with 70 million people. That's like one-fifth the population of the U.S. Why are you even looking at the U.S.? And so this is another thing that you really want to think about. When I go to India, I get really frustrated when I see companies trying to replicate what's happening, happening in the U.S. for the U.S. It's the worst thing ever. You really have to understand your customer. So the beautiful thing about, you know, in Turkey is you can understand your customer. You can do customer development. You can spend time interviewing customers and solving the right problems locally before you go global, okay? And that's where we come in. We help companies build their companies locally, and then if they have problems that are solvable on a global scale, we help them go global. 
So, you know, we're doing the same thing now in India. We're encouraging these diverse teams to sort of get together and, and go create companies. We're doing it in all the other markets that we're in and then helping them go global. And then the one most more important thing than anything else is when you reach success, you have to become a mentor. So even if you leave the country, you must come back and mentor the other entrepreneurs in order to make this ecosystem successful. You absolutely need to do it. It's your duty to do it. It's your duty to go out and speak and spend time helping entrepreneurs be successful. And the last thing I want to say is we need, absolutely need more women in tech. It is a must that we get more women in technology. And, and I will just say, you know, we have to encourage our daughters to go to STEM. We have to encourage design to be part of the decision making at the table. So it's not just about engineering, okay, it's about creativity. If you do not have a creative person at the table, we will not consider you for our accelerator program. So you need a creative person, you need a design, uh, sorry, a creative person, which is typically a designer, you need an engineer, and you need a business person with some depth of field. And we'd like to see men and women at the table because I promise you there's no better way to get diversity of thought than to put a man and a woman at the table trying to make a decision and come centrally on a product that can reach a broad audience. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the time.